Shall we give the Lord a clap offering, church? Hallelujah. It is always a joy and a privilege to bring God's word into your homes. I'm thankful to the Lord for giving us grace to study two books throughout this year, the one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Philippians. What a joy it has been to study these two books in depth. Now, as we come to the end of this year, I want us to reflect upon the things that do matter the most. Fundamental things that we hold on to as a church. And uh, as we look forward to entering into the God-ordained, God-blessed 2021. So today, it's going to be a one-off message. I'm titling this message, Next Generation, Neighborhoods and Nations. I'm going to speak from Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3 and Luke chapter 24 verses 44 to 49. So it's going to be based on these two texts, but I want to talk about neighborhoods, next generation, neighborhoods, and nations. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Open our eyes and give us listening ears, mighty God, and a heart that is willing to obey your word. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And even this morning, we pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us, minister to our hearts. We give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' precious name, the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Praise God. Today's topic is Next Generation, Neighborhoods, and Nations. We're going to touch on two texts today, one from Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, and Luke chapter 24, verses 44 all the way to verse 49. Now, I want to take this subject of the kingdom of God. You know, throughout this year in our small groups, we were studying God's big picture. What wonderful book. And in that wonderful book, we see an overview of the biblical theology of the kingdom of God. Now, if you have gone through the small groups throughout this year, you would know what we define as the kingdom of God in this church. What is it? It is God's people under God's rule and blessing in God's place fulfilling God's purpose. Now, you and I are part of the kingdom of God. Now, many times we forget that we are part of the kingdom of God. Many times we forget what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. And so today we're going to explore this. I want to take you to Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to verse 3. Let's read it together. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. See, Luke, when he writes, by the grace of God, Luke, the doctor, has given us two books in the New Testament. In fact, if you add all the verses together, he wrote the most amount of verses in the New Testament. And God had given him that grace and the privilege because he lived a sacrificial life, gave up his uh, uh, life as a physician and followed the Apostle Paul. And God has now given him the privilege of writing two books in the New Testament the gospel according to Luke and Acts of the Apostles. Now here, he is writing to Theophilus, the second book. The first book he refers to is the gospel according to Luke. And now this is the second book, the Acts of the Apostles. And both these books, the whole reason why he wrote it is so that he can highlight what Jesus began to teach and do while he was on earth. So in the, gospel of, in the gospel according to Luke, he writes about Jesus' life and teaching and the ministry that Jesus carried out while he was on earth. But in the book of Acts, he begins to talk about after Jesus' ascension, how did Jesus carry on to do the work through the Spirit, through his people, through the church. And that is what is recorded for us in the book of Acts. But I find this fascinating. In these first three verses, he gives us an introduction to this book. And he says this, that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and remained with them for about 40 days. And during that 40-day period, he taught them on one subject. 
Now, sometimes I wonder, you know, if we would ever get an opportunity when we are in heaven to be able to replay some of these videos of how Jesus taught his disciples and what were some of the things he taught them. How wonderful it will be. Now, here, it, this is what the Bible says. There's one thing that Jesus taught. What was it? It was about the kingdom of God. Now, we need to explore this because Jesus, during that 40 days, emphasized the teaching on the kingdom of God. Now, Luke, as he explores the, how the church began and how the church advanced, he's also going to carry this theme of the kingdom of God throughout the book of Acts. Now, I want to take a pause button here and I want you to explore with me what this book of Acts is all about. See, I'm a student of scriptures and I, when I teach, I always give people some lenses to look at the book so that the book can unpack, unlock itself. Now, when it comes to the book of Acts, it's a narrative passage. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of stories put together. But is there a theme? Is there some a key significance that we can catch about this book? The key question is, what, how can we understand the significance of the book of Acts? This is how you will understand. I'm going to give you four clues which can be used as lenses to understand the significance of this book. The first clue is this. It is not just about what Luke wrote, but it's also about what he did not write. See, whenever you're studying a biblical passage, you not only look at what is being written, but you also need to pay attention to what is not being mentioned. So you not only pay attention to the speech, but you also pay attention to the silence. And here, the first clue is what Luke did not write about. I'm going to give you some things that Luke did not write about. Firstly, even though he talks about the church being started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and how the church continued to advance in Asia Minor, he doesn't give you a, a prescription of this is how church should be. In other words, the first thing that this book is not about is church model. See, many times when you read a passage, you have to ask yourself, is this descriptive of what is happening there or is it prescriptive for my life? Here in this passage of scripture, he only describes how the early church met and what they did and how the church advanced, how the kingdom of God continued to advance. But never does he give you as a prescription, this is how you are to do. But here, the, the main thing is he doesn't talk about the church model the church structure, how you need to govern yourself, how you need to put policies in place. That's not this book is about, isn't it? The second thing this book is not about is it is not about the geographical expansion. See, Luke does write about the church which began in Jerusalem, then went all the way to Rome. He covers the geographical expansion, expansion in some degree, how the gospel spread through Paul and through Peter and through in Asia Minor, how churches have been planted in different cities. But yet, it is not about the geographical expansion of the church. Why? Because during the 30-year period of the timeline of the book of Acts, see, first two chapters roughly give you about a year or two. But from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 12, it is about 13 years, Bible scholars will tell you. But from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 28, it covers a span of 14 years. So altogether, it's about a 30-year timeline. But in this 30-year timeline, the gospel has actually reached all the way to the shores of India, in the north to Mesopotamia, and in the south to Egypt. But that's not covered here in the book of Acts. Why? Because it was not about the geographical expansion. That was not the focus of Luke. So it is not about church model. It is not about geographical expansion. Or maybe it is about a model Christian life. Maybe it is about how we need to be this kind of Christian. No, no, no. Even if that's not included. Why? Because in all these 28 chapters, there is no imperatives for us to follow. In other words, there's no commandments in this book. Very unique. I want you to think about this. Maybe someone would say, maybe it is about the personalities. Because he did talk about Peter. And then he talks about Paul. But I want you to think about this. The first 12 chapters, Peter becomes prominent, but then abruptly he ends it there and he doesn't continue about Peter except mentioning him one time in, in Acts chapter 15. But from 13, Acts chapter 13 all the way to 28, it is about Paul. But even then, it is 
it abruptly ends. It doesn't cover the entire life of Paul. Listen to me carefully. It is not about the personalities. Now, why I'm harping on this, I want you to think about this church because the church world today is caught up in celebrity syndrome. The church world today is caught up in personalities that are larger than life. Or they have so many people following them on Instagram or on Twitter or on Facebook. And this is popular preachers and people crowd towards them, attracted. The book of the Acts of the Apostle was not about celebrity pastors. Listen to me. Secondly, the church world is today caught up with a geographical expansion. Oh, we have churches in 120 countries. Oh, we have churches in 28 countries. Oh, we have churches in all these countries. Listen to me. It was not about the geographical expansion. It was even though the church advanced and we thank God for it. But it, that was not the focus. But what is the key focus? See, church world today has so much things that polarizes the church. You know, the church in Hong Kong is polarized over what is going on there, the riots and, and over the Chinese government. There's such a polarity within the church. There is church that is polarized in America right now because the election had divided the church into two. And people are polarized. And these are not the things that we should be concerned about. Listen to me carefully. In the Acts of the Apostles, the Bible is very clear. It was not talking about a church structure or governance or a model. It wasn't about a Christian uh, model, Christian life, or even the personalities that we need to follow or the geographical expansion. So that's the first clue. What Luke did not write about. Let me give you the second clue. What is the second clue? When you study this book in the 28 chapters, Luke actually goes on to give you summary statements every now and then. After a major chunk of narrative, he will actually give a summary statement. So I'm going to give you five summary statements and these five verses will give you a, a clue as to what this book is about. Look at this. Number one, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, look at what the word of God says. The word of God continued to increase. Circle that word increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Hallelujah. So the first summary statement is this. People came to obey the faith. People came to obey Christ. Disciples multiplied greatly. And the word of God continued to increase. That was what it was about. Secondly, Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Look at what the Bible says. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Again, the church was established in peace and it was being built up by the Holy Spirit and it continued to multiply. Look at the language, increase, multiply, people becoming uh, disciples of Christ and becoming obedient to the word. Acts chapter 12 and verse 24, the third one. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Hallelujah. The word of God continued to advance. Fourth one, Acts chapter 16 and verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. In other words, more new people were placing their faith in Christ and the word of God was continuing to advance. The church was continuing to be built. Hallelujah. Last one. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Summarize all this. Word of God increased. People of God multiplied. And people became obedient to Christ. And people took this gospel and began to preach. And the word of God began to advance. The church continued to gain ground. And the kingdom of God continued to advance. That's the key thing about this book, isn't it? So that's the second clue I'm giving you. Five summary statements. Let me give you the th third one. The third clue is this, how the book ended. It gives you a clue. Look at in Acts chapter 28 and verse 30 and verse 31. He lived there two whole years, talking about Paul the apostle, at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God. This is the last verse how this book ends, Paul is proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I want you to catch that last two words. That's how the book 
of the Acts of the Apostles ends without hindrance. The Word of God was being proclaimed. The Gospel of Jesus Christ was being proclaimed and the people of God were being added into the church. And the Bible says, Paul taught about the kingdom of God, proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ without hindrance. The NASB translation says this, unhindered. That's the last word of this book, unhindered. Why would it end abruptly like that? They want you to catch this. The word of God continues to make progress, advance, it un increases, it multiplies, people are being added, people are becoming obedient, and it continues to go without any hindrance, unhindered. I want you to catch this church. Our church, the church of Jesus Christ, is unhindered. Hallelujah! It is not hindered by COVID. It is not hindered by any pandemic. It is not hindered by any crisis. Even when Paul was arrested and put in prison, the Word of God continued to increase. Why? Because the Word of God can never be bound. That is why you and I are part of an unstoppable church. Hallelujah. We are part of an unstoppable kingdom. And this kingdom will continue to gain ground. This gospel will be spread all over the world. And today, through technology, God is helping us to reach the world with the gospel. Hallelujah. I want you to think about this. We belong to an unstoppable kingdom and an unstoppable church. Fourth clue I want to give you what this book is about. What is the significance of the book of Acts? The fourth clue is this. A major chunk of the writing that Luke dedicates, he dedicates to the three missionary journeys of Paul and also through the three trials that Paul encounters. Now, as a student of scriptures, when I'm studying this, I ask myself this question, why does he emphasize the three trials of Paul at length? See, in those days, when you're writing, you, are, it's, you don't have the luxury of writing a long letter. You have to keep your matter content concise, isn't it? Now, this is important. But Paul here takes, uh, Luke here elaborates Paul's trials. So I ask myself this question, is he trying to prove Paul's ministry? Is he trying to vindicate Paul's ministry? Is he trying to attest that Paul was doing the will of God? What was this motive? I want to use the words of Paul in this book to help you understand why they focused on the trial so much and why they, that was the focus. The reason is because, look at this, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 28. The reason Paul went through all these trials in different places and ultimately end up in Rome is because of this one mandate from God. What is it? Acts chapter 28 and verse 28 gives you the conclusion of Paul's ministry. This is what it says. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God, what is it? The salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Listen to me carefully. The conclusion of the matter is that salvation has now reached the Gentiles. The word of God has now continued to advance and reach the Gentile nations and the Gentile world. And the Gentiles are coming into the family of God. Hallelujah. Now that is what this book is all about. I want you to catch this church. The reason why the, the, this is so important is because the gospel started in Jerusalem. It was proclaimed to the Jews first. The Jews accepted the gospel. Because Jesus came as a Jewish Messiah. And the Jewish Messiah and the gospel was proclaimed to the Jews. But from there, the Bible says, the gospel began to advance. The word of God continued to increase and it continued to multiply. And it reached the Gentile nations now. And as a result of the ministry of Paul and the ministry of the Holy Spirit through his apostles, the word of God has now reached the Gentile nations. And Gentiles have come to the family of God. Hallelujah! This is the plan of God all along. The plan of God right from Genesis chapter 12. This has always been the plan of God. You shall be a blessing, God says to Abraham. And in you, the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Salvation was not just limited to the Jewish nation. Salvation was unto all nations. Hallelujah. 
I want to take a moment and I want to give thanks to God because salvation has come to the Gentiles like you and me. If not, we won't be here, isn't it? Shall we give a moment of praise? Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you for the gift of salvation for the Gentiles. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Now, why, how, how do I summarize the book of Acts? So therefore, the book of Acts can be summarized as this. It is all about the mission of God, which is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the nations, every nook and corner of the world, to all the people groups, including the Jews and the Gentiles. So it is a mission of God to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the nations. Hallelujah. That is what it was all about. So the kingdom of God is this. You and I are part of this kingdom. And this kingdom, there is only one mandate. It, the mandate is that we belong to God. Through the death, through the burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we belong to God. And because we belong to God, we have been purchased with a price. We have been redeemed at a cost. And today we belong to Him. And because we are set free, we are delivered. We don't belong to this world. We belong to Him. We belong to the heavenly kingdom. Today, what do we do? We take that good news of Jesus Christ, that He took my place. He died for me. He rescued me. He delivered me. He set me free from the wrath of God. Today, I will never be condemned before God. I will always be treasured by Him. Why? Because He has given His life to redeem me. Hallelujah. And this gospel... This good news need to reach every person living on planet earth. And that is the kingdom of God. You and I are part of this unstoppable kingdom. We go out, we proclaim this gospel. <clears throat> and that is what this book is all about, isn't it? Praise God. Now, this is what Luke wrote to Theophilus. He said, for 40 days, Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God. Now, he never explains to you what actually Jesus taught. He doesn't give an elaborate sermon in the book of Acts, what Jesus taught in the 40 days. But I want you to understand this. I want us to ask this fundamental question. What does he mean by the kingdom of God? And what are some of the core things we need to understand about the kingdom of God? I want the Bible to explain Bible. I want Luke to explain to us what he means for 40 days Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. So where do we go to study about the kingdom of God? Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Because in Luke chapter 24, Luke the author, when he wrote the first book, Luke chapter 24 deals with the resurrection of Jesus. It starts with the resurrection of Jesus and it ends with the ascension of Jesus. In verse 53, he was ascended into heaven, hallelujah, by many witnesses. So now, in that chapter 24, he talks about after Jesus raised from the dead, after he was resurrected, that 40 days, what did Jesus teach them? Luke is a brilliant writer. He summarizes the entire teachings of Jesus for 40 days in just three phrases. And I want you to catch these three phrases because from that, we learn what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. Three things. So if anybody asks you, what does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God? What are the irreducible minimums? See, as a pastor, I always look for the irreducible minimums because I'm a simple man with simple, uh, simple framework to think about things. And I bring it down to these three things. That's what Luke gives us. Go with me to Luke chapter 24. And verses 44 all the way to verse 49. Let's read it together. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Everything that the word of God, everything that has been written in the Old Testament, isn't it? The, the, what the Bible gave as a promise to what the Lord gave us a promise to Abraham, what he, uh, how he brought a covenant of people in the book of Exodus, how, the, how he gave them a land in, in Canaan, and how he gave them kings to rule over them, how he sent them into exile, but then brought them back, 
and then how he gave them the prophets to keep pointing to the word of God to say Jesus is coming back. This Messiah is coming for us, isn't it? That, that's the key thing for you and I to understand. Jesus was explaining to them what is written about him in the whole Bible, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I want you to circle that verse because twice in this passage in Luke 24, it uses that same phrase. Jesus opened their mind to understand scriptures. The first time it was on the, on the way to Emmaus, on the walk, when he was walking with two disciples. Remember that? And he opened their eyes to see the beauty of the scriptures. Here, the Bible says, he's speaking to the apostles whom he had chosen. And here, during that 40-day period, he's helping them to open their mind to see the scriptures all over again. See, this is why in this church, we pray, place a high importance upon the word of God. Listen to me carefully. We believe in the sovereignty of God and we believe in the solid authority of the scriptures. We want the scriptures to be the final authority. The truth is found only in the scriptures. Listen to me carefully. No extra revelation. We don't run after a prophet. We don't run after any other book. We come back to the word of God. This is important for us. And Jesus says, study the scriptures. Open their understanding. And what did he teach them? He taught them three things. This is what we're going to look at. Look at this in verse 46. And said to them, thus it is written that, the, that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. The first key to understanding the kingdom of God is this. First key, salvation is only found in Christ. Hallelujah. Salvation is only found in Christ. Where do I get it? This is what he says. Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Hallelujah. It is the power of Christ's work on the cross. Both his death and his burial and his resurrection from the dead. And many of them have seen him. They are the ones who saw him, isn't it? And he has presented himself as proof, living proof to them. And so Jesus was telling them, this is the gospel. This is the, this is the main essence of being part of the kingdom of God. It is to recognize that salvation is only found in Christ. Hallelujah. I want you to take a moment and think about this church. How do you enter into the kingdom of God? You cannot enter into the kingdom of God just because you were born in a Christian family or because they gave you a Christian name or when you were a baby, they baptized you or christened you in a church or just because your grandfather built a church or just because you come from a nation where the whole nation attributes that they are a Christian nation. Listen to me carefully. You can only enter into the kingdom of God by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, by acknowledging that salvation is only found in Christ, that he died and he was raised from the dead. He died not for his sin. He died for my sin. He took my place and he died. He was condemned to die because that was a condemnation that was upon my life. He took my place. Listen to me carefully, church. You and I are so blessed, so privileged. This is what we believe as the gospel, isn't it? The life that we could never live before God, a perfect life, Jesus lived it. And when the life he lived, he gave it to us. And the life we lived, the life of sin, he took it upon himself. And the Bible says this, he took our place so that we can take his place and because he took our place, he was condemned, he was rejected, and the wrath of God came upon him on the cross, and as a result, he died. When he died, you and I died. When he died, he died for our sin. He died to pay the penalty for our sin, to redeem us from our sin. Hallelujah. And the word of God says this, when you believe in him, when you believe that he took your place, he who knew no sin became sin, you become the righteousness of God because a divine exchange has taken place. He took your sin. He gave you his righteousness. 
he became poor. We through his poverty might become rich, the Bible says. He became cursed by hanging on the cross because through his poverty, through the curse that he became on the cross, we can be blessed of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says that divine exchange took place and that is what we believe in. Salvation is only found in Christ. Can I humbly say this? You may go kiss the hand of a Pope or you may walk to a pilgrimage site or maybe you dipped in that river that you consider as holy. None of these things will save you. Eternal damnation awaits us. But the only way to be rescued from eternal damnation and the only way to come back to the Father, the one who loved you and created you, the one who created this world, the one who is waiting for you to return home, is only through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Can we take a moment and just give him praise? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for Jesus who died for us, who gave his life for us so that we can be redeemed from every curse, from every sin, and we are delivered from this present evil age so that we can be part of the eternal kingdom of God. Salvation is found only in Christ. Hallelujah. That's the first thing about the kingdom of God. The second key to unlock the kingdom of God to understand it is this, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name, in his name, to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Listen to me. Salvation, first key, salvation is only found in Christ. The second key, this salvation that is found only in Christ must be proclaimed to all nations. This salvation is for all nations. Hallelujah. The second key is salvation is for all nations. You and I should not miss this. What is upon the heart of God? Every nation, every tongue, every tribe. God wants every people group on earth to be reached. God wants every nation to come and bow down to him and acknowledge him as Lord. Jesus is the Lord of all the earth. Jesus is the Lord of all creation. And one day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But today, we are here to declare that Jesus Christ, the salvation that he, be, he came to give to mankind, is for all nations. Hallelujah! You and I are saved because salvation did not remain in Jerusalem but the people who heard this gospel, who was transformed by this gospel, they took the message and they came to the ends of the earth. And today we are able to serve this living God because someone from somewhere traveled, isn't it? With this gospel. Praise God. The third thing I want you to catch this is this. Verse 47 all the way to 49. Let's read it together. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed, circle that word, in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Hallelujah. What is Jesus saying here? The kingdom of God is not only the first point, which is salvation is only found in Christ. The second point, salvation in Christ is for all nations. Thirdly, salvation in Christ for all nations must be proclaimed by the people of God in the power of His Spirit. Now listen to me carefully. You and I have an obligation in the kingdom to proclaim this gospel, to proclaim that salvation is available for mankind, that salvation has already been done for, for on the cross of Calvary, that Jesus died for your sin. Jesus died to forgive you of your sin. Come back to God. Come back and give your life to Christ. Hallelujah. This needs to be proclaimed, church. And that is what being part of the kingdom of God is all about. Salvation is found only in Christ. This salvation in Christ is for all nations. Thank God for that. Thirdly, this salvation in Christ must be proclaimed by the people of God in the power of His Spirit. You and I can't do it because we will give all sorts of excuses in our flesh to proclaim this gospel. 
But the Bible says, if you wait upon him, he fills you with power from on high. The power of the for the power of Christ, the power of His Spirit. Holy Spirit comes upon you to make you witness as well as to be a witness and to give you the power, the energizing that you need to go and share with boldness and confidence and courage this message of the gospel. Hallelujah! That is being part of the kingdom of God. And here the Bible says, these are the three things that you and I, we need to understand. Let me share this in closing. I'm thankful to the Lord that we are part of a kingdom of God. Aren't you? I'm thankful to the Lord that someone, somewhere, God sent them from a nation, from another nation. People came all the way to India. I'm thankful to the Lord that the doubting Thomas, the, the apostle of Christ, even during AD 52, he already brought the gospel to India. And through that, the gospel has advanced. So the gospel has been in India for more than 2,000 years. And I'm thankful to the Lord for that. And because of that, my family could come to place their faith in Christ. And I'm thankful to the Lord for people who sacrificially took their, uh, they, they moved from country to country. They moved, left their loved ones, left their family, left their comfort zone, and they stepped out in faith to bring the gospel. I'm thankful to the Lord. See, I want you to catch this church. During the first 180, the 180, there were about 360 non-believers for every believer. In the 8100, there was 360 non-believers for every believer. So in those days, one believer has to reach 360 people in order to touch the world with the gospel. But do you know how the ratio is right now? There's only seven non-believers to every believer. That's it. There's only seven non-believers. That means if you can touch seven people who do not know the gospel, who do not know Jesus Christ, who do not have not placed their faith in Christ, who do not know that forgiveness is available for them, who do not know how to live in freedom, hallelujah. You and I can come and present that gospel. All it takes is for every Christian to just touch seven people. The whole world will hear the gospel. See, some of us, God will put it in our hearts to go into the nations. Some of us, we will, we will pack our bags and, and we will go from the nation that you're currently living in because God has placed you in your heart, a nation to go and, and present the gospel there and live among people who do, have not heard the gospel and be a witness there and touch lives there. But it's not just a mandate only for a few. Some of them maybe have that call to go to another nation. But all of us are brought to this nation by God for a purpose. Listen to me. If you're a migrant in this country in, of Australia, you didn't migrate here because you found a better life. It was the divine plan of God. You were, you were being led to come to this place. That's why I want you to listen to me carefully. If you're migrated to another country, it is because God has divinely, sovereignly moved you to that place for His purpose, for, to fulfill the mission of God by bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people that are living around you. That's the reason. The reason why He brought you into that neighborhood. The reason why He helped you buy that house in that neighborhood or build that house in that neighborhood. The reason why He placed you in that workplace. The reason why he, God has done those things in your life which you consider as a blessing. There's a bigger picture and the picture is God is moving His people all over the world. God is placing them strategically in places where they can be a salt and a light, where they can be a witness, where they can proclaim the gospel, where they can live out this gospel-centered life and they can proclaim that Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus Christ is my King and Jesus Christ is saving people today. Hallelujah! You and I have this mandate. As I begin to come to the close of this year, 2020, I want to declare this over you, church. Enough of us staying muted in this season. You know, in this season, the whole world went to a shutdown and lockdown and people are staying indoors and people don't want to meet anybody. People don't want to go out and do things. That's the way of the world. The way of the people of God is different. We take risks for the glory of God. We take risks for the, for the, for the glory of presenting the gospel to the people. How? Open your home. 
Invite your people from the neighborhood. Knock on doors. Invite them. Come, open, open your homes to be a place where you can watch the service together with other people. Don't just watch alone or don't just watch with your family. Watch with some friends. Knock on the doors. Open the people and open your home and invite them to come. You be the host. You be the facilitator. You be the one who ministers to them after the service is over. Watch the service, worship and word and everything together. But at the end, you pray for them. You lead them to Christ. You disciple them. This is an opportunity. Don't waste it. Hallelujah. The reason why I entitled this sermon, Next Generation, Neighborhoods and Nations, because that is what we are praying for as we enter into 2021. Our target is the next generation. There are many young people who are struggling. They come from single family homes or they're coming from uh, single parent homes or they're coming from dysfunctional homes or they're going through crisis because mental illness is plaguing the next generation. You and I as people of God, we should be standing together with them, opening the arms and welcoming them and proclaiming the gospel that brings freedom. Hallelujah. Don't remain silent, church. We need to reach the next generation. We need to reach the neighborhoods. I want you to take this as a challenge from your pastor. The, the Lord is knocking on your door of your heart to ask you this. Why did he move you into that suburb? Why did he give you that house to buy? It, it is a strategic positioning of the Lord so that you can go and be a salt and a light in that neighborhood. Don't knock. Invite people. Open your home. Invite them to come and give and, and do that blessed strategy that we talk about. What is it? Begin with prayer. Listen to them. Eat together. Share your story. Serve their needs. And present the gospel in the, as you share the story. And through that, people will come to the saving faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So next generation, neighborhoods and nations. If we can touch a single family, if we can touch a single community, if we can touch one city, if we can touch one nation, we will continue to disciple the nations as the word of God has commanded us. So church, in closing, let me encourage you as we come to the end of 2020, reflect upon this year, how many opportunities we have missed. You know, my wife and I, we made a commitment a couple of years ago when, when the Lord spoke clearly that we are surrounded by just Christians and I don't have that many pre-believers in my sphere of influence around me. So we developed this strategy, the blessed strategy, where we sat down and wrote down the names of people that whom God has given us as divine op uh, appointments. We prayed for God to give us divine appointments and by the grace of God, He gave us. I be we begin to talk to the, the, the person who is at the checkout counter. We begin to talk to our barber. We begin to talk to our chiropractor. We begin to talk to people that God has placed in our world. Little did we know that people are so open we invite them into our homes for dinner. My wife cooks a meal and we share the stories and we share the testimonies of the goodness of God. And through that process, we have seen people take the step to be curious about the gospel. So we do alpha with them. We give them, we give them, we present the gospel. And through that process, we're discipling people unto salvation. Listen to me carefully. It can be done. We need to do this in this season. Why? The coming of the Lord is at hand. So if 2020 is already coming to an end, don't waste the summer. Summer is the best time. You can put a barbecue and you can bring people in. I've watched the service together and have a barbecue after. Watch the service together and do a picnic together. Do something to bring and engage with pre-believers because that is what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. We acknowledge that Christ is our king and in him we have salvation. Salvation is only found in Jesus. And this salvation in Christ is for all nations. And this salvation must be proclaimed by the people of God in the power of his spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Continue to speak to our hearts, mighty God. I pray for the coming year 2021 that you will ignite this passion to, to prayer walk in our neighborhoods, to ask God for divine appointments. And when we recognize these are divine appointments, we will take that bold step of faith because we believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is given to us to present the gospel. 
that there will be an opportunity for us to invite people into our homes. I pray, Father God, that we will be, that we can open our homes for people to come in, pre-believers to walk in, for believers to come and be encouraged, that we can watch the services together, we can do life together, groups together, but at the grace of God, we will reach the people that you have placed in our world, in our neighborhoods. And as a result, we will disciple the nation. Father, grant us grace for this. And we ask for forgiveness for all those missed opportunities. But we know, mighty God, in you there are many opportunities to come. So I pray that your grace be upon us even as we finish this year 2020 and begin 2021. We declare this, that we will have the boldness of God. And by God's grace, we will step out in faith and we will see the salvation come to our neighborhoods and come to our nation. In Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen and amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you shalom. Go in His peace, church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. It has always been a joy to bring God's word throughout this year to you. Now, next Sunday is our carol service invite your family and friends. It's a great opportunity for you to invite your pre-believing friends from your blessed list. And even your neighbors, just door knock, bring them, invite them. So you can watch the service together, the gospel being presented and the carols that we sing. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to reach out to your neighbors. Have a watch party, have a house party, have something together and don't do this alone. Do it together with your small groups. Come on, it's time for the church to rise up and proclaim the gospel boldly. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We love you, church. God bless you.